if he should see the convoy of an African minister. Not our president, I'm not touching the president. The presidents are in a different world. The African minister. The African minister will never queue. Oh, he's an anathemic. Oh, the African minister is a demigod. Oh, Africa. The African councillor in your rural home, when they go to churches, not even if it is not their denomination, they saunter to the front seats. And even our latter-day clergymen will invite them to share their wisdom with the people, even if we know that they are village fools. <laughs> if there is anything that we must run from Western Europe is that they have gone through enough problems and they are capable of organizing their affairs and they have demystified political leadership. We must demystify political leadership going forward. And once we do that, and I think we can do it because I can now begin to see something happening in Africa. Young Africans are beginning to ask such a question. Africans are beginning to recognize that corruption is a cancer in our body politic. They are beginning to recognize that those who want to buy their votes don't mean well for them. They are beginning to recognize that there is enough money to change their lives if the thieves are eliminated from the political arena. They are beginning to realize that commercialization of politics is a threat to democracy. They are beginning to rise up. And I think that those who have not smelled the coffee will be surprised. They will be surprised when the ground moves from under their feet. They will be surprised when Africa begins to elect individuals who can demonstrate that they have ideas because the politics of the 21st century is the politics of ideas and about competition of ideas. And therefore, when one is appointed into any public office because of the demands of the electorate and this relationship between the African member of parliament or the African president and the electorate is a symbiotic relationship. It is symbiotic in a very perverse manner. And I suspect I'm misusing the word symbiotic, but I'll use it or misuse it nevertheless to the extent that it explains my point. What happens is that it appears that the electorate has allowed the so-called leader, because many of them are misleaders, to remain in their positions of power and to acquire as much as they can on the understanding that periodically their loot will be shared with them. It is some kind of Robin Hoodism of a latter day kind. And this Robin Hood kind of politics is a little bit different, at least from my understanding. Robin Hood robbed the rich in order to share with the poor. But our latter-day African Robin Hoods are in the business of robbing from the poor in order to give a pittance to the very poor. And this is what we are talking about today when we talk about commercialization. So that if you ask any typical African politician, how much does it cost, for you, cost you to be elected into parliament, they'll tell you it is in the millions. It is in the millions, and the millions they spend is perhaps 10 times more than they'll ever earn through their legitimate salaries. And I ask myself, if your salary in five years is going to be 1 billion Ugandan shillings, why should you spend 5 billion Ugandan shillings to get into that office? There must be something that we do not see but you see, and I know what it is. <laughs> what it is, is that getting into the office of the member of parliament, or indeed any other political office in Africa, is a guarantee that things will come. So that in many African countries, the politician is the major tenderpreneur. The politician is the gatekeeper. 
The politician is the one who receives the guests. He is the tax collector informally aside from the URA. And in this regard, therefore, we must commercialize politics. We may blame the politicians, but what about the electorate? The electorate also is to be blamed. The electorate has insatiable thirst and hunger for things that they have not worked for. They have been trained and they no longer listen to ideas. My good friend, Norbert Mao, who I was told was here, I do not know whether he is, he is here, will tell you, not that I have talked to him this morning, but he will tell you that one of the pains that one has to endure when you confront your typical African electorate is to convince the electorate that ideas count for something. Many times when you address the electorate and you are waxing eloquent telling them when I'm elected I'm going to ensure that we have uh, good health services, we are going to ensure that we have good schools, we are going to ensure that we create opportunities for innovation and invention and create opportunities for young men and women. They are waiting for you to finish. They will tell you, we hear you. We know you are going to do all those beautiful things. But in the intervening period, I must eat. <laughs> and therefore, no matter how beautiful your ideas are, if you don't carry money on that day, your ideas, like the elephant before them, will never fly. Leaders who, upon ascending to power in Africa, became demigods. How many of you here will forget Mobutu Seseseko? How many of you here will forget Jean Bedel Bokassa? How many of you here will forget Samuel Doe? And then we had the emergence of guerrilla movements where people rose against their very own who had used their positions of power to destroy what had been gained over the years. And then, in those early days, you will also remember that many African leaders, including the enlightened ones, took the view that because of ethnicity, it was necessary to unite the people. And whether you are speaking from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, or Lusaka in Zambia, or Kinshasa in what was then Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, or you are speaking from Nairobi in Kenya, and here in Uganda, the clarion call was that we must have one-party states. And the justification for one-party states is that, was that we are so disunited, there are so many ethnicities, that if we allow multi-party politics, then what would happen to us is that we would be negatively ethnicized and that we would break our countries and that therefore, to ensure that there was unity, we needed one umbrella under whose auspices and under whose guidance the people would be united. But no sooner had we sufficiently articulated the beauty of single party states than Western Europe told us, no, that is not democracy. Democracy means that you must have many political parties. Democracy means that you must have regular elections. Democracy means that you must have the civil society so that our brand of democracy as we embrace it today, I dare say without fear of contradiction, was not conceived in Africa. It was conceived for us in Paris. It was conceived for us in Madrid. It was conceived for us in London. It was conceived for us in Washington. And we have swallowed it line who can sink up. Africa does not tell our own story. Africa does not design what is in our best interest. Africa still waits to be told what is good and right. And I dare say that that is why Africa does not realize our potential. 
But yet it is also important to point out that the African and African countries are more resilient than the European states. You know, if you allow me latitude as a guest must be allowed, <laughs> permit me to say this. The ethnicity that we keep on talking about African countries are just slightly over 60 years since they regained their independence. Take Nigeria, for example, with over 500 ethnic groups created within an artificial boundary. They have had their problems, they have had their hiccups, but the nation is still alive and well. The difficulty is notwithstanding. Take Uganda, for example. You've had your difficulties, you've had your trials and tribulations, but the nation is still alive and well. Tanzania, with over 136 ethnic groups, the nation is still alive and well. There is a sense in which, in the face of our difficulties, we have succeeded in managing those difficulties, however painful it has been. But look at Europe, the pontificating Europe. They cannot handle diversity. They cannot. And it's important to remind ourselves this, if only to energize ourselves. The Europeans have had to fight two major tribal wars. They called them world wars. They were tribal wars. The European tribes were at war with each other in 1914. They may have recruited a few Africans and a few other people, and then they call it World War. Then they had another major tribal war in 1939 through to 1945. They didn't call them tribal wars. They called them World Wars. And I want you to look at Europe and the purity of their nation. If you go to Sweden, the nation is almost 90% composed of the Swedes with a small lapse population, and for that small population, they even have a separate parliament for them. That is how they handle it. You go to Finland, 90% of, of Finland are the Finns with small Swedish population. You go to the Netherlands, the same. You go to England, or the Great Britain, whether it's great or not, I do not know but he's the great Britain. Even there, if you talk to the Scots, they have something to say about the English. If you talk to the Irish, they have something to say. If you talk to the Welsh, they have something to say. Go to Spain, where there are a few more tribes, they had a civil war. Go to Italy, largely the Italians. And you walk across to Eastern Europe, Yugoslavia was united as one nation under Joseph Broz Tito. Did they not produce many countries during our lifetime? The Soviet Union has given birth to many countries. They have gone into ethnic purity. Africa remains the only continent on earth that somehow, having had artificial boundaries imposed on her, saying that we will retain those boundaries and make the best of it, and one need only go to the pronouncements in 1963, the pronouncements of Kwame Nukuruma and Julius Kambarage Nyerere on the inviolability of the boundaries, repeated again in 1964 in Cairo, in Egypt, that if we choose to redraw these boundaries, Africa will be perpetually at conflict, and therefore, heavens have given us a lemon, let us not ask for an orange, let us make a lemonade unto ourselves. And we are making the lemonade. 